Parenting teens and young adults in today's secular culture can be daunting, but church teaching and sacred scripture provide parents with valuable guidance. Join us today as author Kimberly Hahn leads our discussion on how parents can raise their teens to honor the Lord with their lives as they become mature adults in the faith. I'm Father Michael Scanlon, President Emeritus of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. the teen years is the biggest challenge they face in raising their children. But adolescence can be a blessing rather than a burden. I'm Father Michael Scanlon, President Emeritus of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. We're here with our regular panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, Professor of Systematic Theology at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, Professor of Biblical Theology at Franciscan University. And our special guest is Kimberly Hahn, a mother, grandmother, a popular author and speaker on marriage, faith, and family. And with her husband, Scott, she co-wrote the best-selling account of their journey to Catholicism, Rome's Sweet Home. She's the author of the Biblical Wisdom series of books, the most recent being Legacy of Love, Biblical Wisdom for Parenting Teens and Young Adults. So, Kimberly, you and Scott have looked forward to the teen years of, with each of your children. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> you know, when I first had Michael, our oldest, uh, and my mother came to help, he was just a week old, we talked about it. And it uh, seems like an odd time that you would talk about the teen years, but she yeah. began planting the seeds in both oh. of our hearts yeah. that the teen years are the most wonderful years because it's that transition time yeah. into adulthood uh. where they're thinking very large thoughts about life and the world and politics and faith. And that if you focus on building the relationship, then in the teen years, that has a chance to really flourish. And so over the years, she planted so many seeds, and that was nurtured by other other people. Yeah. But, but not, I would, but not many other people. <laughs> <laughs> no. And not many I'll, other I'll be honest. When she yeah. shared that with us, yeah, it was the first time. She was the first person. I never imagined anybody would come up with what wisdom and counsel that sounded so inane as the teen years are something you look forward to. Yeah. But I mean, she planted the seed and I tried to let it grow, but it was sort of like, I believe, help thou my unbelief. That was th almost 30 years ago. Yeah, because yeah. the image out there is independence and rebellion. Right. And yeah. how are you gonna That's st right. strain them? And the experience for some yeah. of us was yeah. independence and rebellion. Right. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, what you sow is what you reap. <laughs> and right. So since yeah. I was that way, I kind of assumed all teenagers that we uh, raised would yeah. be too. I mean, the image of the surly teenager is not entirely a caricature, no. but uh, it, it seems to me that, that you were a, a teenager not long before uh, your mother <laughs> pronounced that <laughs> prophecy, right? And so maybe she had fresh and happy memories of your own experience. Well, and I think she anticipated joy. She anticipated, yeah. and so did my father. And uh, uh, looking for ways in which we would be maturing in our faith so that we were in that transition time of becoming a brother or sister in Christ, yeah. not just a child who was having God mediated to yeah. us. Um, you know, I, I, a parent of a young child is, is continually explaining things and mediating. Um, and then in the transition years of the teens, you really are stepping back and watching God work very powerfully and directly on yeah. their lives. And I think even the anticipation of it is part of what causes teens to step up to the plate because independence doesn't have to equal rebellion. And I think it's best right. not to anticipate rebellion. If it comes, and we've had children that have struggled with various things in the teen years, sure. um, if it comes, then 
you deal well, with that and there's grace to yeah. deal with that but it's it's there's grace in time of need. If that is not where your children are, yeah. then there, you don't need to prepare for that. Yeah, it's, it's but maturity, so you do need right. to prepare yeah. for. Don't throw it all into one box, yes. but That's be right. ready right. Yeah. to walk with them and see yeah. the difference. You know, I can remember when she said this, and I remember what I did with it, because if she had said it a year or two before, I would have just tossed it. I wouldn't have taken it seriously. But I'd already experienced your family enough to realize, okay, it works at least in one context, you know, because there was, you know, what sociologists might call a plausibility structure, you know, <laughs> something that made it somewhat believable. Yeah. Uh, because at that point, I think your youngest brother, who's now a pastor, was five or six. Uh -huh. And then you had four, you know, you had four siblings, a couple of whom were in their teen years. And I was, I was studying your folks as they were parenting teens and thinking, I've never seen it done this way. Wow. But I wonder if it works. It's so far it had with you, but uh, you know, it was one of those things where they, they really called them on to live up to these expectations of maturity and charity and virtue. And I think in many other instances, I, I kind of lived down to the expectations that my parents had because they dreaded the teen years, like most of their friends were dreading the teen years and most of their kids were living down to those expectations wow. too. What scripture is a foundation <laughs> to this? To Help the parents and help uh, the book of direction. Job. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, one of the ones that I taught Michael and Gabe as little children, and then we talked many times in the teen years about it, is from Psalm 119, 9 and 11. How shall a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to thy word. Thy word have I laid up in my heart yeah. that I might not sin against thee. So pointing them beyond ourselves to the standard God had. Uh, has and yeah. also letting them know I had an interesting conversation with one of our teens a few years back we'll leave it general sure. um, I had just been thinking a lot about the fact that the scriptures bring us and the church brings us to the same standard so it isn't something I simply impose on my teens yeah. I have to be respectful I need to be truthful yeah. I have to I have to um, have self-control over anger and so we we had a little exchange and he said well just chalk it up to the fact that i'm a teen and i was be able oh to be my. very calm and say no right. yeah i have to come to the same standard and within moments his little you know reaction yeah. quelled and he said you're right i'm sorry that was really disrespectful huh you know it was like yes <laughs> So, yes. uh, so bringing them to a standard that also applies to us. And then we have good. to give them the freedom to correct us respectfully, but to correct us, yeah. you know, to say, Mom, you tell us not to be anxious. Yeah. You're anxious. Can I pray with you? Oh, my. And responding to that yeah. and saying, please pray for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you're really, you're really seeing good. me in a moment of weakness, and yeah. I, yeah. I want to honor Christ. So, yeah, you call me honoring when you got to lead them in the discipline of life. Yeah. That they have uh, basic skills and they have basic limits and, and, and that's a, um, quite a process. Yeah. yeah. And I think when we recognize that huge things are happen happening in their bodies, you know, yeah. they're probably the two years, when they turn two years old and when they turn into teens, they're having the um, largest growth spurts, they're having uh, hormones, um, all <laughs> kinds yeah. of major changes. Sure. And so not labeling them and saying, well, this is the way you're always going to be. Oh. But at the same time, not saying, well, that's just teenishness, yeah. Yeah. you know, right. yeah. because we don't want to say that misbehavior is acceptable, right. but we also want to understand there is that desire for independence, right. just like the twos. And within the right boundaries, yes, you step back as a parent, you say, yes, you can have more freedoms. You can, but then you can lose freedoms when they're not I, I properly like, I like yeah. that notion because I think it's very freeing that maturity and, and judgment and character uh, are not simply a function of chronology. Yeah. It has to do with becoming human. Uh, and you're human from the first moment of conception, which means you are held to a standard. You've got to conform to a code, a level of excellence. And the fact that you happen to be 17 doesn't give you a pass. Uh -huh. It's not a license to be belligerent or impossible. Yeah. But you start before then teaching these disciplines on hygiene and 
living mm -hmm. in need and respecting <laughs> others and the rest of it so that uh, that's right you right. don't all of a sudden just approach them and say okay now that you're a teen right here's here's this large yeah. body of teaching that <laughs> I should have laid the foundation for. This may sound like special pleading on my part, but I think fatherhood yeah. is a special challenge for men in our culture because you have more cultural support for, for moms, soccer moms and all the rest, whereas men, mm -hmm. you know, you, you find it hard to find father figures on TV. And that's been true for the last two or three decades. Yeah. Um, and so for me, fathering teens was a special challenge. And again, your dad helped me a lot uh, because I remember writing a phrase down, fatherhood is non-anxious leadership. Huh. You know, I could see some fathers who were not anxious because they just checked out. I could <laughs> yeah. see other fathers who were yeah. leaders but extremely anxious right. because they were trying to pull or drag yeah. their kids along. And so I could see in him and others too a kind of cell of non-anxious leadership, coupling that with studying the ways of God the Father in Scripture, in salvation history. I mean, here is God the perfect Father, and there are the Israelites, <laughs> rather radically flawed, you know, sons and daughters. And so if the perfect divine Father can be patient, you know. And another passage that really struck me in Scripture was one that you would cite a lot, and that was almost all of Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and then he goes on to talk about how if there's anything true, anything good, anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, think on these things, yeah. you know. And I'm thinking, okay, that's hard with teens because when you look at teens, it's almost the case that you can only see the flaws, the things that you ought to point out that are criticizable. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if God treated me that way, right. I would wither up, you know, I'd dry. Right. That's right. Right. I, and so I tried to see how he is doing it with me and then apply it to them. And I had a good example to follow because, you know, we joke in our family about mom being pathologically positive, you know. She <laughs> always <laughs> finds the good, you know. Uh -huh. And so I, I, I try to take that, you know, follow that lead and identifying the good and praising and affirming and finding out that in the process of doing so, the greatest gift that I think fathers can give to their adolescents, especially their daughters, but also their sons, is affirmation, not flattery. Not where you're just That's kind of praising them to puff them up, but where you really do identify the good and you affirm you gotta that. Got to pick the right stuff, and That's they right. know it. That's yeah. right. They That's know right. it. You know, if you're always talking about how their eyebrows are cute or something like that, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. blow Whatever. it off. But if it, yeah. something yeah. means yeah, they have a sharp eye for uh, deception. Uh, they can see when they're being hoodwinked. Yeah. They they want the truth. They want honesty. Right. And that's true for the criticism as well. Right. But right. I mean, it's sort of like. The, the affirmation is the anesthesia that yeah, you administer right, before right. the surgery you know, right. uh, of the criticism. You anesthetize you know. them right. yeah, for well, 10 years. Well, how about the process of moving out, you know, when they're not going to be living with you any longer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how traumatic is that? Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> It, and I'm not saying this as just a plug for the university. Sure. It helps a great deal if this is the kind of place you send them to. That's right. Yeah. 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 Truly. Five out of our six kids have come here, which is less than a mile from our home. Oh and the sixth one wants to come here. And so, uh. you know, it, it makes the trauma a lot less. Yeah. Because we're so reinforced. Yeah. We know, I mean, they'll be exposed to all kinds of things at the university sure. that we're not exposed to at our home. And we're realistic Including about my lectures. that. Yeah. We're realistic yeah. about that. But at the same time, we're so supported. And I yeah. think yeah. that is a part of parenting into young adulthood is what, what are the influences that we yeah. surround our children with? The quality of friends that our kids have found here have yeah. been life-changing. Oh, and right. our two oldest have married uh, wonderful gals they met here. And so... Uh. So we've been, we've been blessed at a lot of different levels, and that also goes along with the kinds of friends they choose, even in, in junior high and high school. You know, is our home a place where they can bring these friends, where we can know them and know their parents, and, and do we follow through on rules? Like one of our rules is you don't have young women over when uh, when we're away, you know, if one oh, parent's sure. in, well, you say, oh, <laughs> sure, but you know, there are know so it, many do, families where that's, right. they don't right. even ask. You know, so as to keep this from being an ad for the university, I do think that a big part of parenting teens 
is encouraging them to look at the right schools. If you're, if you're going to go to college or university, you know, narrow the list down as to what the options are because it really is an extension of parenting. You know, the teachers are in loco parentis in the place yeah, of parents. Yeah, that's a good point. And so can... we had, it wasn't just this school. It wasn't, you know, right. Fisher Cut. We, we, we had two or three other options. Yeah. They all chose this. But I think you've got to be very careful about what kind of schools will we pay for yeah. you to go to because, you know, yeah, the dangers are real. And that's been very effective with so many of the students. They said, Amen. well, my parents said they'll only pay for. <laughs> yeah, A, B, or C. One, <laughs> that, you yeah. know, that kind of gets down to an 18-year-old. What are you going right. to mm -hmm. do there? do there? It's scripture. What... Has that been a foundation or a help oh in how you approach these things? But Very much so. And you know, <laughs> the, a verse I pray probably every day, but in a different context, often related to our children, is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens uh, me. Yeah. And Lord, I can you know, spend this time with this particular teen through Christ who strengthens me. You can give me the words of wisdom because he's the source. He's That's the right. source of, of the grace we need to parent teens. Well, we, when we come back, we're going to pursue this. There's a lot of challenges here as we look at the teenage and we look at the challenge. Stay with us. Growing up, the way that my family really helped me develop in my faith, it's kind of twofold. My, they always were a, a moral example, just that bastion of moral orthodoxy. My, my parents always showed me the way it needed to be. We didn't always study the Bible together. We didn't read the catechism together, but they always said what was right and what was wrong. And they were always there for me. They were present to me. And that meant more than anything for them to be there for me like that. I would say that prayer goes a very long way, especially nightly prayer in the form of the rosary or reading scripture. And even if it seems like their children aren't listening or aren't exactly engaged, it, it helped me so much. My name is Michael Villanueva. I'm majoring in philosophy and theology. Last semester I had sacraments with Dr. Hahn. And uh, I'll tell you right now, it was the best class of my entire life. A every class, I'm just knocked out of my chair. It hits me like a ton of bricks. The beauty of the truth that he's speaking to us. Something so simple, God's but so beautiful and so profound and so powerful. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Welcome back. I'm Father Michael Scanlon. We're here with our regular panelists, Dr. Scott Hahn and Dr. Regis Martin, and our special guest, Kimberly Hahn. And we're talking about parenting teens and young adults with biblical wisdom. Kimberly, let's talk about relationships outside the family circle. How can parents help their kids build healthy friendships beyond the family? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I think it's um, one of the challenges for parents is finding that way to make your home one of the gathering places. Ah, the gathering um, place. I like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. You know, we, we buy some extra chips and soda and have yeah. it in a place where it's easy to get to. We try to uh, encourage them, oh, you're looking for a movie. Why don't you rent one? It'd be cheaper and, and invite your friends over. Um, yeah. You give them, give them. Get some to know space, their friends. Get to know yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like a world apart from you. And the Catechism talks about the virtue of friendship being so important to the virtue of chastity. So on the one that hand, that is worth repeating. Yeah. The virtue of friendship being so important to the virtue of chastity. Yes. It's not a removal. Go off and act like you're in a monastery. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Nor is it approaching peers as something simply negative because yeah. peers can really call each other on to heroic yeah. virtue yeah. Yeah. and modesty and, yeah. you know, and the right way to treat guys and gals. Sure. And, and then I think, and, and I don't know if you want to talk about this yet, but the whole idea of um, dating in high school is something we have, we have really urged our children not to do. Yeah. Um, not because we don't value friendships and, and opposite sex friendships, but because we value them more. And yeah. when they get into these exclusive relationships, it takes peer groups right. and they, it makes things strange. They don't know how to function 
uh, with each other because now they're in this exclusive relationship and then that yeah. thing that relationship breaks apart and now they don't have their circle of friends anymore. So you're let me, saying let me socialize with those of oh. the opposite yeah. sex but you, but you are cautioning against exclusive this dating, dating. Yeah. yeah. And let's just be honest and say that it hasn't always been easy. It has always been clear. Yeah. But we've had challenges, and then when we had to take a stand, we did it not to be popular, but to be parents. And the, uh, the, 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 the result was, I think, very, uh, very positive. And uh, it took a bit of time, most recently, for one of our teens to come back and say, thank you, you know? Yeah. But he came back and said, thank you. Yeah, I um, remember my mother was so good at it and my dates wanted to see my mother more than they wanted to see me. <laughs> At times they just said, oh, can we see mom, can we? Yeah. She was just so welcoming yeah. and That's so her. encouraging. Yeah. And that is, oh, such a asset. Maybe, so, maybe if you had been more charming, Father, I know. Uh, you wouldn't have become a celibate priest. <laughs> there are all sorts of You know, ladies. once again, I, I think we also have to acknowledge that the university and the larger Steubenville community is, is unique uh, not absolutely unique, but relatively right. different than a lot of other yeah. places. And so, you know, not most, it isn't the case that most Catholic families grow up in a community like ours. And so, you know, if you can't choose to live in a place like Steubenville with this kind of strong Catholic family culture, choose your parish carefully mm -hmm. as to what yeah. youth group and what kind of support system you're going to have for family values. It might mean driving an extra 10 minutes or something. I'm not sure. saying go about church shopping, but I mean, find that place where you're going to you're going to help your teenager find the right kinds of friends. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I think the, the argument against having particular, exclusive, uh, insular friendships is, is a sound one because it's unhealthy to be sort of fixated on one other person, particularly if, if the, the current that runs between you is eros. Yeah. You're too young uh, to, to manage that. It's a consuming fire. And in a friendship, the people are not really focused on each other, but on some third thing that they do. You know, we play football, we toss the Frisbee, we collect stamps, we eat pizza. Yeah. I mean, that's healthy. Yeah. Right. So what does a wholesome relationship look like when they start dating? Uh, and, and how can parents, in an upbuilding way, guide their kids in that direction? You know, I think you've got to make sure not to start right when the relationship begins. You've got to yeah. start long beforehand. You know, I, I think back to, we've had five boys and one girl, or one rose and five yeah. thorns, and so <laughs> I felt a special sense of responsibility that when they turn 12 yeah. or 13, I talk about the teen years to them yeah. as a, a race that they have to run where they're going to come across hurdles that they have to clear with respect to friends who are swearing, mm. who are smoking, who are watching pornography, who are going to be you know, tempted with drugs. And we identify the key hurdles that they're gonna have to clear. And at the same time, recognize that if you stumble, get back up and get back into the race as well. And so we also develop a conversation, you know, you know a future spouse, what, what do you think she ought to be like? You know? And always in the back of my mind, I recognize that they're gonna be describing somebody who's gonna be remarkably similar to their mom. Yeah. Because I think she's been such a strong and positive force of presence in their lives. Yeah. So talking about that, I think, is a way of preparing for actually entering into healthy dating relationships. How do you hit the bragging part? Hmm. You know, a guy I really made out, how far did you go? Uh, did you get her? all this kind of language yeah. that develops in the teenage years, you know, that it's well, I, some kind of a... Yeah, I, mean, I think early yeah. on you need to inculcate a sense of respect for other yeah. people. It's a function of justice and, and temperance. You don't demean other people, uh, even if you're four or 14 or 24. There's never an excuse uh, for sort of uh, belittling or diminishing the stature of another person. I mean, it's perfectly odious to speak that yeah, way. Yeah, but it's, that, That's not right. what gentlemen do. But it yeah. starts with, did you get a kiss good night? Yeah. You know, and then it starts to yeah. add to yeah. that. Yeah. What's next? Did you get a field? Were you close to? Were you, yeah. you know, and all this kind of It's stuff. a hard thing. You know, it's very difficult. But again, I would say you got to back up and start earlier than, you know, when they actually begin the dating. Because I can remember the, the talk about the race and the hurdles. 
I, I remember also the, the, the sex talk. Actually, it wasn't one talk, it was a series of talks. And the point was to draw the contrast between the lies of the culture, where you're gonna be hearing that sex is good, you know, or great, and that sort of thing. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna impress upon you what you already know, and that is according to the faith, according to the church, according to God's word, sex isn't good or great, it's holy, it's sacred. Mm -hmm. Nothing we do with our bodies can render us more godlike than when we engage in this sort of sexual intimacy in a marriage covenant. And so, talking about how our bodies are temples, and so is her body. Yeah. And so, to desecrate that just for pleasure is really to profane what God yeah. sees as holy. And to set those categories, which we as Catholic parents have, that most people out in the culture don't have. Yeah. Especially when you, when you link it with openness to life. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. one of the things that we life use giving. in talking to our kids about right. dating Early and courtship. On. Because if you're, not, if you're not ready for family life, yeah. you're not ready for marriage. Right. If you're not ready for marriage, right. you're not you're ready, ready for, for engagement. Sex. You know, and yeah. you just work your way right. back. And that's where, I mean, a child is a blessing in the context. Yeah. Uh, well, a child's always a blessing. But in the context of marriage, that's the right context. Yeah for bringing you, a new life. And so you've got to you, take steps backward then to safeguard that. How do you inculcate courtship again? You know, that there's a whole process. It isn't just like TV. Uh, did you have sex? Did you make it all the way? Did you, it, this right. kind yeah. of stuff. But the whole process of courtship uh, is such a strong Christian tradition. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, ups and downs. Far from perfection oh, in our yeah, situation. Would, but, now, uh, to be honest, in Legacy of Love, I take a couple chapters where I try to explain steps. Yeah. You know, and it will look different for every couple, how they are able to live that out. Um, for one of our children right now, you know, he's in town because he's here at the university. He is seeing someone who's in town. So both our families yeah. are actually part of this process. Yeah. They both read the two chapters in the book. Uh, um, they don't know what God's plan is for good. their lives, yeah. but they've moved into what they are referring to as an intentional friendship. Uh, Joe approached his her father yeah. and asked permission. Oh my, uh, just for the friendship. Just for, for the courtship. For moving to okay, this for the courtship. first oh, stage, yeah. Yeah. and yet good. it's not full-blown courtship. And right. what they're doing is they're But it was permission to ask her out on a date. Yeah. I see. Yeah. 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 To have him engaged in the process, the father. Yes. Um, so I think it involves That's family. That's even smart. <laughs> yeah. Especially when the guy is a cop. <laughs> Yeah. With a gun on his hip. Yeah. Yeah. I have known Catholic cop for a dad is a pretty great, great <laughs> incentive for purity. But one of the things they do as a couple is if they want to go take a walk and pray a rosary, they'll invite another couple to go, or they'll invite, you know, two or three gals. They they are trying to keep their circle of friendship wide. They are involving family. Um, so those are some of the steps that are different than typical American dating. Yeah. And I think that typical American dating <coughs> is much better training for divorce than it is for marriage. Right. Yeah. And that's what we're trying that's to say. Is how it, it's a recipe statement. for disaster. Typical it's American dating is what again? Training is for divorce. Training, yeah, yeah. Because more than marriage. Because you're you're forming an intense emotional and sometimes physical bond and breaking it and forming a bond and breaking right. it. Yeah. And during these formative years yeah. where so yeah. much human development needs to occur, yeah. that growth is being stunted as you're allowing one individual to either define you as wonderful or to define you as yeah. cast off clothing. Yeah. Being tried, or, on, tried you on. Or a, a great car when it was new, but now that it's really used and worn out, you know, we're gonna exchange Training. it for another commodity, yeah. I mean, everything in our culture tends toward the objectification of the opposite sex, and so, why, why are we yeah. startled? The result. Even the word dating, I, I think, is, is, is to give it more dignity than it deserves because it's, it's mostly about hooking up. It, it's promiscuous, uh. it's wayward, it's anonymous. Uh. I mean, oftentimes, you know nothing about this partner. So and how, it, it trivializes and yeah. trashes right. yeah. the sacredness of the other person. So how, and the damage, the fallout in terms of, of, of destroying human beings uh, is, is widespread. So how do you start the talking at what age so that you're getting the right values in before the peer culture 
comes on with hooking up and yeah. Yeah. run the risk yeah. of starting yeah. too yeah. early rather than starting exactly. too late. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not about mechanics. That's right. not what you need right. to start with. But right. when we have a, a, a baby, you know, to say to our children, uh. mommy and daddy love each other so much and look at this beautiful gift mm. that God allowed us and, and it caused to come into being through us. And the fact is, if, and I know you've experienced this in your family too, Regis, when, when you continue to be open to life, you don't have to talk about the sacrifices that come with having a baby because they will see them. Right. Yeah. Was, but they see it in the context of the right relationship right. and the joy and I remember Michael coming through the room days before having Joe. He was 11 years old, and he said, is there anything more exciting in the world than having a baby? Yeah. Isn't yeah. that good? Yeah. What a Isn't fabulous that a great thing yeah. to yeah. say that, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to write a homily for these kids. They're drawn into this web of grace. Uh, they recognize that we're enjoying it, but they also yeah. recognize that we have to work at it. Yeah. That it doesn't, you, know, you don't marry two intense right. personalities like ours and not strike sparks at times. Right. And so it takes work, it a lot of, text, yeah, yeah, it does. But those sparks generate life. That's yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> well, more light than heat most so of the time. We're going to keep going in this, the areas of relationship and chastity, and as they get older, adult children and families, how do you guide and support in the right way? Stay with us. My mother has always been an inspiration for me in the faith. Um, she always led our family in um, nightly rosary. And through the constant living out of the life outside of church, being true to the faith, not always, not just being a, a Sunday only Catholic, um, she inspired me and showed what it truly means to be Catholic. And from there, that foundation was built. And so when I went off into college, I had that foundation and I knew what I believed and I was able to live it. For me, it was my parents' example. Um, they both um, are very devout Catholics. And um, the fact that they taught it to me themselves um, showed me that they valued it and they constantly emphasized the fact that they were teaching it to me so that I could um, take on the faith and then in turn I could pass the faith on. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy and you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back. We're here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, surrounded by our students working the equipment, a theology faculty on the panel, and with our special guest, Kimberly Hahn. We're talking about relating to adult children with new families of their own. That's a little more complicated. Kimberly, what guidance can a Catholic parent give when their child gets engaged to be married? Yeah, it's a real transition. You know, every once in a while I'll hear someone say, you know, you're not losing a child, you're gaining a child, and it's, your universe both expands and contracts. Yeah. But you don't go into separate universes. And somehow or another, how, how do you make that transition? And, and I think you start by acknowledging it is a real transition. Um, there is an already not yet where your child who's engaged is now needing to form that more healthy interdependence with that other particular person, and yet uh, is not fully in that commitment until they're married. And so, so you have to somehow stretching make them part of or connected to the family, but not yes. so far in that if things get disrupted and, you know. and don't That's work right. out that it's going to be messy. And right. it's, it's one kid at a time. You know, and, and one size doesn't fit all. And so you have to really be flexible. Um, and you also have to be willing to learn from your mistakes and acknowledge those mistakes uh, as you proceed. Um, I, I think the analogy of a dance has helped me the most. Mm -hmm. um, I asked several friends, you know, okay, how do I do this? How do I become a mother-in-law? 
And for the most part, they were just, oh, just shut up where tan was what one person <laughs> said, another That's person right. said is just back off. Yeah. And it was so negative. And then I, in the context of dancing, it made sense. If someone yeah. is teaching you a dance step and they say, now take a step back, then take a step forward, that's neutral. That's mm -hmm. not yeah. offensive. Yeah. And so if emotionally I could step back and give more space for them to bond more deeply and then as a couple invite me into that relationship at a new level, then we were dancing ah. and we weren't tripping over each other and, and the dance floor wasn't too crowded. And, you know, and I think it's a really helpful analogy because you are still very important in their lives. And that's part of your fear is, oh, do I even, do I have a place here? You well, know? you do, and of course it's not going, rushing too far in yeah. and not pulling back. It takes that. To extend the analogy, it's also helpful to think of it that way because then when you make a mistake, you can assume the best intention on the other person. You know, because when you're dancing, sometimes you step on the other person's foot, yeah. but not because you, you wanted to hurt right. them, but because you, know, you were a little bit out of step. Right. And, and I would say that our two daughters-in-law would really testify to the fact that, you know, We've made mistakes, but uh, you especially have entered into that dance in a way that is really constructive. Uh, yeah, a, a lot depends, of course, on the sort of dance uh, yeah. that you're doing. If it's right. a waltz, uh, then I, I think it's humane and it has a rhythm that you can, you can move with. But if it's hard driving rock, uh, mm. then it's hopeless. <laughs> well. But uh, I mean, in, in terms of, of, of a ritual action, for me, uh, the most heartrending moment was walking down the aisle to uh, surrender my daughter oh, to geez. this strange man. I mean, about whom I knew enough to be confident that he wasn't going to kill her. Uh, I could entrust her to him, but letting go was really painful. It you was, know that it I've was heartbreaking. Had, I've had trouble as the celebrant getting the father to let go. <laughs> yeah. He takes him down the aisle and he keeps <laughs> holding <laughs> to him. And, and you've got a problem with that? <laughs> and you've got to wrestle him yeah. to the floor. Right. <laughs> I know we've always got to be careful with, uh, with programs like this not to date them, but uh, <laughs> I'm facing a situation not unlike what you're describing here. Is and that right? uh, yeah, yeah I, can, I can feel my muscles, you know, <laughs> spasming sure, as I think of clutching true. tight and not letting go. But at the same time, you know, we've, we've really, uh, as you said, instilled these values in our daughter, and we are so proud and grateful for the man that, brought, that God has brought into her life. You know, a man. Uh, who we have been praying for for many, many years. And I want to oh. say this too, yeah. because yeah. what we want to do is instill in parents the sense that you got to be praying for your future in-laws years before your kids end up meeting their future spouse, you know, and pray for the wow. future spouse of each of your kids and pray for their families and as well. A, yeah. and, and that's big because usually you hear, okay, I'm going to pray that she finds the right guy or she finds the right girl, but they, you're making it much broader yeah. for the families, for the in-laws, for the broader relationships. I would hear her father yeah. pray for the future spouses of, of, of her younger siblings yeah. and of our own kids yeah. and for their families as well as the future spouses. And it just, it really creates a kind of habit of yeah. prayer that I think yeah. is very, very healthy. And you, you Genesis 2.24 is key to this kind of thing. Tell us. The leave. Sure, the need to be prepared to leave and cleave yeah. and become one. Uh, the morning that we got married, my mom came into the bedroom and she said, no, honey, I just I want to ask one more time. Are you sure oh, that yeah. Scott's the one you want to commit your life to? And I said, what do you mean? And yeah. she said, it's not that I have a doubt, but you, you can still say no. Uh. But she said, I want you to know that when you walk down the aisle, his home is where your home is right. from here on, and you are not welcome here in bad relationship with Scott. In other wow. words, this, because some people will marry, you yes. know, they're off their kids and say, now remember, this will always be your home. Yes. You can right. always come right. home. Always and my mom wanted difficulty. me to know yeah. the right. door slammed shut. Yeah. Well, God bless in that her. way, wow. I know. God because bless her. Hedge. Your yes. vets, yeah. yes. right. irrevocable, you're yeah. burning your bridges. Yeah. And, and there was a great token of that, a wedding gift that she got because she grew up in Cincinnati, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and the first <laughs> two months of our marriage, the, bank, uh, the, uh, the Reds and the Pirates were in the playoffs. <laughs> oh, golly. And she gave a baseball to Kimberly 
my mother-in-law gave it to her daughter, signed by Willie Stargell with a quotation oh. from the Book of Ruth, your people shall be my people. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Stargell. Yeah. Well, she has a sense oh. of humor. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> yes, yes. But and that was a powerful, it was serious. That was a powerful yeah. thought. And along with this, the one thing I do want to mention, and I realize this is in the area, you know, that every couple will have to make their own decisions, but I really believe um, strongly that our children should not be uh, unequally yoked. And I think yeah. many parents take a handoff approach of, you know, I'm, I'm just going to teach my child and hope they make the right decisions. But in our family, for what it has cost us to try to have a Catholic family, we have told our children, we do not want you evangelized dating. We don't want you mission dating, mission yeah. dating, no, dating someone. Dating non-Catholics. Okay. We talk about the Eucharist as a one flesh union yeah. with Christ the bridegroom. Yeah. And then we talk about marriage as sort of replicating that. And so how can you enter into that if you can't even share the Eucharist right. with your spouse? Now, obviously, there are limits to our capacities to enforce this sort of thing. Sure. But at the same time, we've really made it a high priority for our kids to see, hey, look, we were divided for four years. I became Catholic in 86, Kimberly in 90. Yeah. Those were the four toughest years. When we wrote Rome Sweet Home, I think it was more therapy than anything <laughs> else, you know, uh, for ourselves and for our marriage and family. And so we have the kids, you know, learn from our lessons. And, you know, obviously they're free. But at the same time, they're free to learn from our experience, too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all right to evangelize people, but, but this ought not to be the apostolic yeah. project right. of two people yeah. in love. Ulterior motives, <laughs> right. all of the rest. Even if you yeah. feel like you know this is the best thing for this other person, yeah. because it really presumes on the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I mean, I've had young women from here say, you know, oh, I'm going to make him a Catholic. Yeah. And I would uh, say, I don't even think that's a respectful way to approach yeah. a non-Catholic, even, even if, yeah. You might be right, it's the best thing yeah. for him. Yeah, God it's would never do like, that. No. You don't instrumentalize no. people. No. They're not a means. Right. Yeah. And it uh -huh. will affect every aspect of marriage. And marriage is challenging enough when you're on the same right. page. Right. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> right. how do they, you know. Right. Ahead yeah. of time, I mean, you're not just relating to the potential spouse, but to the family. Mm. How do you establish and build up that family relationship so you're building towards being part of rather than being separated and fleeing from. Mm. I think yeah. the way I would summarize it is approaching my child's beloved yeah. with the unconditional love that a parent oh. has for a child. Yeah. I never asked and never will ask myself, do I like my child? I receive my yeah. child as a gift out of sure, our love, love and God's gift of love, right. and I would never go there, and so I don't go there with an in-law. Right. Do I like this person? Yeah. If my yeah. child uh, yeah. has set his or her heart on that person, my response is love. Yeah. And so I try, to, how can I love this person? What gifts can I give? Words of affirmation. Yeah. How can I serve? And the, the tricky thing is that this is a grown adult, which you haven't really been a part of the process of, of their life maturing. Right. But if you think in terms of a parent and you lead, you risk, you risk loving. Yeah. Even when your feelings can get hurt over things, you yeah. keep risking loving, you will not go wrong. Right. Let me add yeah, something too from our yeah. own experience, and that is there's a before and after. You know, before your 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 you know, when your child marries another person and they're now husband and wife, that's one thing. But when they become father and mother, that's an entirely different thing. And so the process of leaving and cleaving and giving them space and independence and kind of allowing them to call the shots, that's hard. That that's that can be very hard. But the and you, you still have to pour out that love unconditionally. Mm -hmm. But once they become parents, you know, I know this was true for us. I began to appreciate my dad a lot more and ask him questions. Yeah. You know, I began to realize, you've been here. You've been yeah, down this path. Yeah, no, but when, when our kids have become parents and to watch her pour out the love upon the grandkids, there is nothing more bonding yeah. with in-laws than that kind of unconditional love and generosity, the affirmation. You're doing a great job, you know, oh. buying Christmas gifts and really going out of your way 
to kind of build them up as parents because nothing is harder than parenting, nothing is more fulfilling than parenting, uh. so nothing is more welcome than the support you get from others in your parenting. Yeah. And I think that's a decisive moment for in-laws to really yeah. play a constructive role. Now yeah. you also teach about Ruth and Naomi and Noah and how that is a real uh, source of lesson and wisdom. Well, I think it can give us hope because we look at our culture and there are people who aren't sure they even want to have children. They're so fearful, they see such godlessness. Yeah. And yet it's possible, I mean, if Noah and his wife could raise three children who chose spouses willing to get on the ark with them, <laughs> We don't know to what level the spouses had faith, but there was something there. Some trust. I think we can take a message of hope that God in his plan will figure out the details. If we live the church's teaching on openness to life, and if our children live that, um, he will take care of the details. And I, I would insert one thing that I, I don't know if you've heard of starter marriages, but it, there are numerous articles now about couples who are married under five years, don't have children, and divorce, and then they go for the permanent marriage. And they yeah. refer to them as starter marriages, but I wonder if uh, one of the keys is not their cl being close to life. Yeah. And what we have found with our children is they've been open to life and risk that. They've opened the door to so many graces between each other, but also from the parents to be able to love and support them. And, uh, and that's been a, a real tender bonding between us. Yeah, I mean, that's ludicrous on the surface. I mean, that's like renting yeah. before you buy a home. I right. mean, it, you know, it really is. Yeah, I think the key insight is you never pull the plug on those you love. And you, you're obliged to love even those you can't like. Yeah. Uh, and if yeah. your son finds this woman lovable, uh, then she must be lovely. Uh, and you have to be drawn into that same circuit mm -hmm. of love. Well, when we come back, we're going to look for final thoughts and help on raising teens into healthy relationships that can yield into solid and fruitful marriages. So stay with us. I remember when I was in high school, I had all these questions on my mind as to, you know, why and when and how. and. All of the answers that you see in kind of like movies and uh, television, they don't cut it. There's not enough there. Um, and it doesn't provide a sufficient reason to live. It doesn't uh, provide a sufficient reason to carry out your life. And uh, with Catholicism and with religion, you have such a beautiful reason, a beloved reason. and. Um, my mother always supported me uh, in venturing deeper. She was there, right there with me uh, studying the faith. And everything I learned, she learned. And everything that she learned, I learned. Uh, taking me to adoration, taking me to mass. And uh, growing in faith with my mother was something that I'll never forget. My name is Kelly Butler, and I'm a communication arts major. I took independent digital filmmaking. Definitely intense. Many all-nighters in the editing lab getting things done. Pope John Paul II has a quote, Do not be afraid to go out into the streets and into public places to preach Christ like the first apostles. That's what we're called to as Catholics and as Christians. You have that responsibility that every work you create should reflect Christ. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. There's a lot more that can be said, but we've come to the end of our discussion on parenting teens and young adults with biblical wisdom. And it's time for final thoughts, takeaway, helps to others, start <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't really know where to begin, uh, right. except to uh, confess uh, to a sense of, uh, of stunned and overwhelming gratitude for, for both of you, for the witness of, uh, of your lives, which you've certainly uh, uh, documented endlessly uh, in these books. Uh, and uh, if your life is the only Bible people read, oh. then it's going to be rich. Uh, and fulfilling. But in addition, you have footnotes. You've got all these blooming books that testify to the life that the two of you so ardently and sincerely uh, live. 
Uh, you quote John Chrysostom in your book, and I was struck by that. I wrote it down. God gives some far more than they need, not so that they might luxuriate in their riches, but to make them stewards of uh, the bounty of, of God. And, and I think that's what you've done. You've become a blessing to other people. Uh, and uh, how can you not but bless uh, that, uh, that expression, that, that achievement? Everything turns, I think, on the attitude, the intention that you bring to the business. I mean, are children uh, an accident that happens to happen? Uh, are they the result of some damn contraceptive having failed to function? Or are they this blazing sacramental being uh, whom we welcome and rejoice to have more and more of? You can never outdo God in generosity. Uh, and I, I think your lives are such a, a splendid witness to this that uh, I, I wish you could have uh, another eight or ten kids. <laughs> because, <laughs> because the path, the ones wow. you've got, have blazed uh, is, is so, uh, so encouraging, uh, so rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Okay, how do you follow that? <laughs> yeah, well, truth and disclosure here, I married up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I would also say that uh, the, learn, the learned lessons from our life together uh, would be to live your faith and enjoy it, mm -hmm. to pray together as a family, and especially when you don't think you have the time to do that, but to do it in a way that's flexible. Um, but also to, you know, we're talking about biblical wisdom, uh, really bring in the Word of God. And not just because we were once evangelical Protestants and now we're evangelical yeah. Catholics, but because the Word of God is just that. Yeah. It's divine wisdom, and we need it. You know, and I can think now, you know, in the long term, we can see you know, our oldest son is getting a PhD in theology focusing on Aquinas, my favorite, and his use of scripture. Mm -hmm. But I remember especially what Gabriel said, you know, he is now a focused missionary working to teach the Bible uh, to students at the Colorado School of Mines. He, he told us recently that uh, when he was a teenager, the Bible just seemed like a jungle. I mean, it's just like, how do you even get started? And he said, all I knew is that whenever I got into it, whenever that would be, it would be fun. It would be a joy. Isn't that good? Because he could see how much we enjoyed it and how uh. enthralled we were with the Word of God. Uh. And I think, you know, it, it's never a false claim to have mastered God's Word, but it's this desire to be mastered by it and to admit the failures along the way, but at the same time to acknowledge how much fun it is and what, what better things have we to do with our lives than to allow the Word of God to permeate. And I think the seeds of God's Word then are sown you know, and it's not just for the, the, the crop you'll harvest in the fall. You're planting oak trees that won't grow big, you know, for many, many years. So you've got to be very patient and trust that God is the one who will give the growth. Yeah. I like that. Patient. Key yeah. word in the whole process. Mm -hmm. Well, Kimberly, you've got this great book, Legacy of Love, Biblical Wisdom for Parenting Teens and Young Adults. What would your final comments be here yeah. after all this? That this is obedience in a long direction for a parent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, this calling, when God gives you a child, is lifelong, but it does change. You don't parent a teen the same way you parent a two-year-old, uh, the same way you right. parent a young adult. Stay engaged. Mm -hmm. You're not done. Just because someone at school says your child's 13 and you really don't have a lot to say, or a child says, when I turn 18, the law says I'm independent. <laughs> it's like God has not released me from this task. Right. And whether it's speaking to young adults about cohabitation, whether it's speaking to teens about those whom they draw into their inner circle of deep friendship and romantic pursuits, we stay engaged. And along with that, it's an increasing vulnerability that we also share, where we allow them uh, to understand we acknowledge our weaknesses, our failures. You know, as they, as they get older, they begin to say, you know, when you did that, that really hurt my feelings. Uh. And instead of reacting and saying, no, I am the perfect parent, to say, <laughs> you are so right. That was humiliating, or that was uh. wrong, or I'm, will you forgive me? Thank God. I mean, my dad has done that numerous times with us where he'll say, oh, I'm so glad the spirits brought that to the surface. Let's <laughs> lance that. 
<laughs> and he means it. And, and yeah. so in gratitude, really, for our parents uh, and for the joy of being called to this, I would just say, you know, uh, for those thinking about marriage and family life, jump in. <laughs> the water's great. <laughs> the water's deep. And the grace of God is there to meet every need, to meet every need. Well, it's a light to hear you express the joy and the positive approach without avoiding the, that there are problems right. and struggles and there's That's going right. to be changes and developments. Right. But you're engaging and encouraging people to go down the road and, and to follow the call that God has in their life. And we have a handout free to everyone, an excerpt on teen rebellion from Kimberly Hahn's book. We need to know a lot about teen rebellion because the media is doing a terrible job with it. As encouraging it. it. Yeah. Encouraging yeah. it, and actually, yeah, yeah, as if this is the way to go, break free and right. break out and do all this stuff. So we'll, we have to, as Christians, grasp onto that. <coughs> anchor ourselves in the Word of God and in the teaching of the church and know that that was going to be fruitful. And if you start early enough and build solid enough, you're not going to encounter the world's rebellion against you. You may still have struggles and adjustments. So we have this handout, an excerpt on teen rebellion from Kimberly Hahn's book, Legacy of Love, Biblical Wisdom for Parenting Teens and Young Adults. It's a great area. Thank you for launching into it and uh, making yourself vulnerable yeah. because you have to <laughs> when you start teaching and, right. and following that kind of thing. And we just want to encourage all of you that there is a pathway, pathway based on the Word of God, pathway based on solid wisdom that you can follow and you don't have to flow with the world's re agenda or the latest TV approach to family life, which can sometimes be terribly uh, undermining. So till next time, may the Lord's blessing of peace and grace be with you. And may you go forth according to the vocation God has given you and bring forth good fruit according to his holy will. And we bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. To receive a free handout on today's topic or to purchase a video of this show, call 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357. Email your request to presents at franciscan.edu or write to Franciscan University Presents, Franciscan University of Steubenville, 1235 University Boulevard, Steubenville, Ohio, 43952.